I want to read this to you. He says, uh, and, I, and I'm not real good at poetry. I, I don't really write poems, ask my wife. Uh, it's just not my forte. Sometimes I don't even read them like somebody wrote them. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best with just trying to read the poetry here. Uh, but he said this. He said, A mind at perfect peace with God. Oh, what a word is this. A sinner reconciled through blood. This, this indeed is peace. By nature and by practice far, how very far from God. Yet now by grace brought nigh to Him through faith in Jesus' blood. This is my favorite part of it. So nigh. Nigh means near, by the way. So nigh, so very nigh to God. I cannot nearer be. For in the person of His Son, I am as near as He. So dear, so very dear to God. More dear I cannot be. The love wherewith He loves the Son, such is His love to me. Why should I ever careful be, since such a God is mine? He watches over me night and day and tells me, mine and thine. I, I love that. Uh, especially that part there in the middle about, uh, for in the person of His Son, I am as near as He. That Man, that, I needed that this week. And it was a blessing. If I could sew, I'd embroider it on a pillow. I'm just telling you right now. <laughs> But I can't sew, and I don't have time to take up a new hobby. So uh, it's not going to show up on any pillows in my house unless uh, someone else does it. But, um, but that's, a, uh, that's a blessing. Um, the fact that we are made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's not just the blood of Jesus Christ, but it's the, it's the blood applied. And that can't be preached enough. That the blood is enough for everyone. The blood is a sufficient sacrifice for the atonement of the whole world. But only the blood applied equals the remission of sin. And that is by faith. That has always been by faith. And it always will be by faith. And I'm so thankful for that. We're going to continue this morning talking about the blood of Jesus. And um, so... Uh, obviously, I'm preaching uh, on, in this series on uh, this Sunday morning. Next Sunday morning, we won't be in series. And I'm happy about that. Uh, not that I want to get out of the series, but because we're in missions conference next week. And if you're new here and if you don't know about missions conference, it is one of our, our favorite times of year in our church. And by the way, it is not the yearly time we focus on missions. We try to focus on missions 365 days a year, um, but it's a special time of emphasis where we bring in some missionary families to challenge us, encourage us. We've even got one missionary family that's new to us. We're going to get to meet them uh, in this next week, and I'm excited about that. We see what kind of needs we can help our missionaries with, and uh, it's, just, it's an exciting week. Uh, we got a lot of kids coming to this missions conference. And uh, I think about last year, it was just all old people, it was boring, it was, uh, no, I'm just kidding, it, it wasn't boring, it was a great conference uh, last year, but, but we, didn't, we didn't really have any kids last year, but this year we're making up for it, all right, we're, we're bringing in the big families this year, and, uh, and, and um, look, I, I don't want to dote on our missionaries for doting's sake, but it is important to our church that our missionaries know they are loved, they are supported, they are cared about. And so we do take ways to show that and try to emphasize um, that we're there for them and, and, and including those kids because I want those kids to go back to the country where God has called their family and remember South Campbell Avenue Baptist Church. Remember the love that was showed them and the support and care. And uh, as of the end of last year, we've uh, added some things to our mission program uh, with just delegating some responsibilities there and making sure that not only we're hearing from our missionaries, but that our missionaries are hearing from us 
as a church. So it's a blessing to us when we get to read about people that have trusted Christ as their Savior on the foreign fields. And so now one thing we're including is some communication from our church, letting missionaries know when people are getting saved here and when people are accepting Christ as Savior and things that God's doing uh, in our church and, and uh, things we're going through with our building uh, process and, and everything like that. Look, I'm going to preach here in just a second. But there's just, there's so much on my mind and heart this morning. And, and I, I want to throw this in there real quick. Um, it, it, was a, it was a blessed week this week in regards to our building. Um, we got the final documents of the city recording the, uh, the release of the easement. We now own the alleyway, all of those properties. That's all officially recorded. We have that in hand. Um, we, we're, we're about finished with preliminary drawings for the new building, still working with the architect, architect on that. So we're just waiting for the last preliminaries back from him before we can go to the city. Not necessarily with a finished product, but with something that they can look at and say, yes, this is doable, no, this is not. And then our engineer is uh, finalized a lot a paperwork for lot con consolidation this week. So it was a kind of a banner week uh, in progress. It seems like it's wait, 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 but then you get these weeks where it's like, man, we there was a lot accomplished uh, in this week, even though you're, some of you are still saying, I don't see any shovels in the ground. <laughs> When's that coming? It's coming. It's coming, Lord willing. Uh, now, I'm going to tell you right now, if Jesus comes back, somebody else can build the building, okay? Because <laughs> we're not going to be here, amen? Uh, and they can have the property, they can do whatever they want to, but... If he doesn't come back, we want to continue in the ministry God's called us to do as his local body. And we want it to be functional. We want it to be practical and to facilitate what God's doing at South Campbell Avenue Baptist Church. And that's why we're looking at this building. That's why we're prayerful about it. And uh, there's uh, hopefully still some excitement about that. In this series on the blood of Christ... We're going to start this morning, and in some future me messages, we're going to continue along this idea. We've covered a lot of what the blood of Christ does for us, and has done for us. But now, what I want to look at is, once the blood is applied in a believer's life, once someone who has, has by faith, accepted Christ's sacrifice for themselves. And God has recognized that sacrifice and forgiven them of their sin and, and granted them His salvation. Then un understand this, the blood is not done in what it accomplishes. Because now the blood of Christ compels the believer in some certain directions. The blood of Christ compels us to do some things. By the way, salvation is not about what we do. But when we get saved, we ought to gladly do. And the blood of Christ compels us in that, in that doing. The blood of Christ compels us in those good works and to be faithful in that. And it's a, it's a drive in that. The blood of Christ compels us to holiness. The blood of Christ compels us to worship. And so we're going to look at some things like that as we continue in this series after the missions conference. But this morning we're going to look at something that the blood of Jesus Christ applied in our lives, compels us to do. And I think it's uh, the timing of the message is fitting, especially in regards to the week ahead of us as a church family. And I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians, if you would please, chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. <clears throat> Verse number 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 17. The Apostle Paul writing here to the church at Corinth, a church that was a mess, by the way, a church that had forgotten and forsaken a lot of the fundamental teachings that the Apostle Paul had laid for them when he 
establish the church. He writes to them and he says in verse number 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now let me just comment real quick on what he's talking about there. There was a lot of divisions in the church at Corinth at this particular time. And there were people that were looking for things to divide them instead of looking for things to unify them. And by the way, when you look for things to divide, you'll find them. They're not hard to spot. Sometimes they're glaringly obvious. But as children of God, especially within a church situation, we're not looking for things to divide us. We're looking for things we can come together on. And, and so there were people that had been baptized by different individuals and they were using this to say, oh, I was baptized of this person. Oh yeah, well, I was baptized of this person. As if the individual baptizing mean, meant anything. So Paul had told them, he's like, I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you. <laughs> Except, he said, maybe the house of Stephanus and some others. But Then he says in verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. The gospel means good news. He says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. In other words, the gospel is not about the cleverness of the declaration, but it is about the impact of the message itself. It's about the substance of what is being told to a lost sinner. And so he says, he says, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Oh, how true that is. To somebody, think, think about this for a second. To somebody who doesn't know that they're a sinner, the idea that God would become man and die on a cross is about the most foolish mythological tale you could ever hear. I mean, the, the world is full of, of, of mythological and, and allegorical stories of cultures and customs and of ancient history and all kinds of things. And there's heroes and heroines and, and all of these type of things. And some of these heroes um, we know would even, would even give their life in some finality uh, of saving a group of people. But understand that even in mythological heroes... The amount of people that they saved was a limited amount. The, uh, the, uh, the, the, the extent to which they were saved was limited. And those heroes never came back from the dead. Well, what makes Jesus different than all them? Everything I just said. You see, he, he died to save others too. But he died to save, save all. And he died to save for eternity. And he came back from the dead. And he's still alive today. That's just the small ways that he's different. I'm being sarcastic. Those are pretty glaring major differences. And so, the preaching to them that perish... In other words, to them that are still in their sins and lost, a message of salvation by a Savior dying on a cross is a foolish message. It, it, in their minds, it doesn't stand up to reason. It doesn't stand up to logic. The reason is because their logic and their reason is tainted by their sinful nature. And, and Paul's going to go on to talk about that in chapter 2 later on, why they don't receive the truth and the things of God. But unto us which are saved, he says in verse 18, it is the power of God 
For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Now I'm going to stop right here because this is, a, this is a pretty monumental verse. And the way Paul says it can get you a little bit tongue-tied. So I'm going to make sure that everybody understands what he's talking about. He says that God made man by his wisdom. According to his wisdom. Using his wisdom. And in God's wisdom, the way he made man, man was to be able to make choices. To rationalize. To choose. Now, do you realize God could have made us to do whatever He told us to do? God could have made us to only know righteousness. To only walk with Him. To only have fellowship. But the Bible says that God in His wisdom did not make us like that. God in His wisdom made man in His image in a way that man could understand wisdom and thereby make choices based upon wisdom which was from God. Uh, let me sum it up like this. God did not create man to be puppets on a string. God made man free moral agents. God gave us choice. God gave us dominion. God gave us these things in His creation. But here's the, here's the thing. If God's going to give man choice, then man has to have a choice. Enter the one tree in the Garden of Eden. You understand, if there's, if there's no choice to be made, then we're not creatures of choice. And so, being made by the wisdom of God, creatures of choice, a choice was given... And man by his wisdom, which is different than God's wisdom, but man by his wisdom chose to go against God. So here's what he says. Paul says, uh, I want to read it again, and maybe we can understand it here. He says, For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. So that's where we've explained there. Understand that God's wisdom is not man's wisdom. And man, by his wisdom, messed up. By the way, we dare not trust the wisdom which is earthly. We don't trust the wisdom that defies what has God said. We don't trust that wisdom. That's not true wisdom. The beginning of... Wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And that is what Adam and Eve lacked when they disobeyed. So they, used, they bought into an earthly wisdom and lost their relationship with God. Their fellowship with God. Their spirit died within them. And communion with God was broken off. Thus, God comes to the garden in the cool of the day and has to call out, Adam, where art thou? It's not like an omniscient God didn't know which tree he was hiding behind. He knew right where he was, but the reason he called out, where art thou, is to demonstrate there's a brokenness in relationship. You're not coming out to meet me. Why not? Well, because we were ashamed. We were naked. We hid ourselves. Who told you you were naked? Did you eat of the tree? Well, then the blame game starts. So, God in His wisdom made man, and man in His earthly wisdom knew not God. I'm so thankful God wasn't done. I'm so thankful... Like the song says, he didn't throw the clay away. But the Bible says, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. By the foolishness of preaching. 
I have one of the most foolish jobs in the world. But I know the power of it. Fundamentally, preaching just means declaration. It just means proclaiming or telling. Uh, We think of preaching as being done by a preacher or pastor from a pulpit and things like that. But in reality, when you sit down across a lunch table from somebody at work and tell them the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ, you're preaching just as much as I'm doing right now. You're proclaiming. You're telling. And, And according to the world's logic and wisdom... God's method of people coming to know peace with God, relationship with God, reconciliation to God, it's foolish. That a message would be declared, and if I believe that message, that's all God needs from me, that's all God wants from me. God's just asking me to believe a message that is proclaimed, and that's exactly what the Bible says. He says, there can be all kinds of disputers of the world. There can be all kinds of wisdom of the world. There can be intellectuals. There can be like the group that is recording the book of Acts on Mars Hill that live to hear or to tell some new thing. As a matter of fact, I think they ought to rename social media Mars Hill. Because you go on there to just hear or tell some new thing. And you can just scroll through and there's a new thing. And there's a new thing. And oh, I didn't know that. And oh, I already knew that. And that keeps coming up on my feed over and over again. What's that doing there? All this kind of stuff. But understand that there's such an overload of information today. There are messages that are flying through airwaves literally at the speed of light. That one message can just get swallowed up in all the information that's out there. Especially if that message is so simple. And yet, Paul writes to the church at Corinth, and it's as if Paul is saying this, You think you've gotten so smart. You think you've become so intellectual. You think that you have become so wise. But you forget that when I showed up, I didn't come to you with wisdom of words. I didn't come to you with some enticing message. If I can use modern day language to say exactly what Paul's saying, Paul's saying, I didn't come to you marketing the gospel. It's not what I was doing. I came and I told you a message. And that message was very simple. So simple, in fact, that many people find it foolish. Many people think, It's too simple. Many people think it needs more substance. It needs needs additions. It needs needs something for people to really do. I mean, uh, we we need to dress this up a little bit if people are really going to accept this. I mean, can you you imagine... Can you imagine uh, uh, the gospel message arriving on the desk of a... uh, a, uh, marketing person. And they're going, huh, you know what? Uh, It's a pretty simple product here, but I think I can make it more flashy. It's all in packaging. We can package this up and we can sell this. Hang on just a second. The gospel is not for sale. The gospel is not looking to find its way into people's lives by coercion, by manipulation, by deception. God's not looking to do any of that. God's method is so simple. It is the the message of a crucified Savior communicated 
and believed. That's it. He said, it, that plan wasn't enough for the Jews. Verse 22, the Jews require a sign. We're going we're gonna to need a sign. It's, it's not enough to have this message or to hear this message. We're going to need some kind of a sign. And it's not enough for the Greeks because the Greeks were so indoctrinated with Greek philosophy. I'm talking about Plato, Aristotle, Sosthenes. Uh, uh, no, not, not Sosthenes. That's a Bible character. Uh, Socrates is who I'm thinking of. Uh, they're, so, they're so inclined to, to think that anything that's true has got to be founded in this wading pool of intellect that's knee deep or waist deep or maybe even up to the eyeballs. I mean, if it's real deep truth, then I shouldn't be able to understand it at first. I should have to think on it for a few years. And then maybe eventually I'll get it. And by the way, that same kind of philosophy has crept into the gospel message for years and years and years. So that there are people who take the crucified Savior and they make it more complex. And they add to the simple message of the gospel. I, I said this a couple weeks ago and I'll say it again. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul was able to state the entire gospel message. His words, not mine. The gospel by which they were saved. He was able to state that in about three or four verses. And that is not just the gospel. It is the gospel message, but it was the statements of the gospel with proof that those statements are so. He gave all that in a few, few messages, a few verses. So all of a sudden, there are people that take the gospel message and they make it more complex or they make it more intellectual. And then when you say, I'm not sure about that, they say, oh, well, you just keep reading, keep studying, think about it. Read this guy's book and you'll eventually understand it. You'll eventually get there. Forgetting that the Bible says... Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. It is the power of God unto salvation. It doesn't need your help. It doesn't need your packaging. It doesn't need you to dress it up. It doesn't need anything added to it. It is a simple message, so simple that many consider it foolish, but it doesn't make it less true. Paul said in verse 23, But we preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews, a stumbling block. They just can't, they just can't grasp that. They, they can't get hold of that. They're so locked into their religious system and their self-righteousness, they just stumble over the fact that God giving His life for mankind is the only sacrifice that God accepts. So unto the Jews it's a stumbling block, unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. This is an interesting saying by the Apostle Paul where he's, he's using some clever turn of phrase. You and I understand God has no foolishness. There's nothing foolish about God. But what he's saying is that from man's perspective, what man would consider from God as foolish is wiser than anything man can come up with. And certainly, after 30-something years, about 39 years of having believed in Jesus Christ for salvation and walked with the Savior and been in this book, I find more and more and more it revealed in God's Word about His salvation that I'm just like, wow, God thought of that. God covered that. 
God dealt with that. Years ago, I started studying about how God made us. And I've preached this a lot, so I'm not going to go over it all again. But God, the Bible says in Genesis 2-7, God made us body, spirit, and soul. And when man died, body, spirit, and soul all experienced death. And then you realize that Jesus came in the flesh and the death that He died wasn't just a physical death. But He died body, spirit, and soul. Some of you aren't impressed. And that's okay. But here's what I'm saying. As a five-year-old boy, when I realized I was a sinner, and with simple childlike faith, I trusted in Jesus and what He did for me on the cross for my salvation, there were so many things about what God did for me I didn't know. But the more I've learned, the more I've realized, He thought of everything. His plan of salvation is so wise and it is so infinite. So simple, so incredibly profound. So simple that Jesus could say, Suffer little children to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. But so profound. So profound that the Apostle Paul would give his life saying this, that I may know Him. The power of His resurrection, the fellowship of His suffering being made conformable unto His death. But he would make sure that there was also the understanding that that while that was his chief pursuit and while he was pressing toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, he would be careful to say, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. I have not yet attained. I don't know it all yet. Look, this is the Apostle Paul writing a man who gave himself wholly to knowing Jesus Christ and what Christ had done for him. And now he's much later in life and ministry and he says, I have not apprehended. I haven't got there yet. I don't understand it all yet. I'm still walking. I'm still pursuing. I'm still following after that I may be apprehended of Christ Jesus. There's still more for me to understand. And I'm telling you, if the Apostle Paul would say there's more for me to understand then I gladly say I don't come close to knowing it all yet but I'm telling you as complex as God's work in salvation is the gospel is still a simple message it's it's one of the blessings of the Christian life It's one of the things that keeps life in Christ fresh each and every day. Is learning more and more about Jesus. More of His saving fullness see. More of His love who died for me. I can almost guarantee you that won't be the last song I quote today. Verse 25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Once again, God has no weakness, but what might be perceived as weak by man is still stronger than the greatest strength that man can possess. For ye see your calling, brethren. This this is my... I love this. Remember, he's writing to a church that's a mess, but who thinks they're in good shape. So this is what he says. He says... Look around at those who make up this body. Now this can come across as one of the most insulting things ever said in Scripture. But watch what Paul says. Paul says, for you see your calling, brethren. He's talking about look around in the church. How that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. <laughs> so look around among you. There's not a lot of strong people in your congregation. There's not a lot of smart people in your congregation. 
There's not a lot of just really savvy people in your congregation, but, but rather the congregation is made up of, verse 27, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in His presence. Let me stop here for just a second and say that if Paul's words were offensive to the people that made up the church of Corinth, then that would be an obvious sign that the thinking of the, church of the people of the church of Corinth was wrong. Because if they see themselves as mighty, and that means something to them, if they see themselves as noble, and that means something to them, if they see themselves as wise men, and that means something to their position or their prominence or their place, then they obviously have not the humility that is necessary to have ongoing fellowship with God. So if those words hurt that would probably be more conviction of the Holy Spirit than Paul speaking roughly to them. But it was probably like this. They probably looked around and said, yeah, that's true. We might have some people in our congregation that used to be those things, but now we're just kind of we're changed. We're different. The, the strong might still be strong, but he doesn't glory in his strength, but rather uses his strength to be a blessing to the weak. There's some really smart people in our congregation, but they don't glory in their wisdom, but rather they use the wisdom that God's blessed them with to be a blessing to those who are less wise. And that, that's, this is what Paul was wanting to get him to see, that in Christ there's no difference. In Christ we don't have these qualifications, these identifiers, these, the, the, these, uh, uh, these medals that we wear on our chest. Because once a person realizes their need for Christ, nothing else about them really matters. To have Christ is to have everything. And Paul would say to the church at Colossae, and ye are complete in Him. So what else actually matters? Does it matter if you're strong, if you're wise, if you're weak, if you're rich, if you're poor? Does it matter what your background is? Does it matter what your ethnicity is? Does your skin color matter? I say this again and again and again. None of that matters in Jesus Christ. Now that's wisdom. A God that can take people that different and bring them together in one person? As a matter of fact, that is so wise that the book of Ephesians says that God's plan of salvation and bringing people together in a local church reveals the manifold wisdom of God to principalities in heaven and in the earth. The angels look at churches and see people come together and love one another and not look at their differences, but look at Christ and realize what they have in common. And even the angels look at those churches and go, only the wisdom of God could do that. Only the wisdom of God could take that person from that ethnic background and put them together with a person of this ethnic background and it's just fine. It's like they're brothers. That's the manifold wisdom of God. And it's revealed through such a simple plan as a crucified Savior. He says in uh, verse number 29 that no flesh should glory in His presence. But of Him, of God, are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom 
and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. All of these things that are needed to have relationship with God, Christ was made all of those things on our behalf. So, verse number 31, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Now, Paul's going to go back to where he started. Because remember, he started in verses 17 and 18 saying that Christ sent me to preach the gospel and I preached the cross. Now watch what he says in chapter 2, verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. This is God's testimony. This is God's story. This is God's account. Verse 2. For I determined, I love this, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Can you imagine how people might have looked at the Apostle Paul when he showed up in a location and they, they realized, hey, I know he goes by Paul, but this is really that guy Saul who was schooled in the school of Gamaliel who grew up a Pharisee, a Hebrew of Hebrews, this guy is a Jew of the Jews. This guy is like the, the Jewish Jew. <laughs> this guy knows the law inside and out. He's a Pharisee. So he not only knows the law, the written law of God, the Torah, he knows the Talmud which is the oral interpretations of the law through rabbis over centuries. I mean, this guy is smart. And you know what? He was. I, look, I'm not going to downplay Paul's intellect at all. He was an incredibly smart guy. Especially when it came to things of the Word of God. He knew the Bible. This is the kind of guy that could answer about any question. And, 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 if, and if his knowledge of the Bible wasn't enough, he was also an apostle that was his particular office designated for receiving direct revelation from God by inspiration. That's significant. And if that's not enough, after he got saved, he spent three years in Arabia learning from Christ himself. And this guy, with all of these credentials, shows up in Corinth, and he only knows one message to proclaim. Paul, we're going to hear you preach today. Okay. Paul gets up, says, uh, what I want to preach to you about today is Jesus Christ, God's Son, came born of a virgin, lived a perfect sinless life. They nailed him on a cross. He was crucified and he died on that cross. He took his body off that cross, put him in a borrowed tomb. Three days later he rose again. And God has declared that what he accomplished by his death, burial, and resurrection is sufficient to God to forgive all sins of all people of all time throughout the entire world. And somebody said, well, that sounds dumb. How do you know somebody said that? Well, go read the historical accounts in the book of Acts. Almost every time Paul preached, you get some, you get some statement like this. And some believed... And some didn't. Well, what was the difference? Well, some of them were chosen by God before the foundation of the world to believe, and some weren't. No. Not going to find that in Scripture anywhere. That's not it at all. It, it, a more appropriate statement would be this. Some had ears to hear, and some didn't. Some open their mind to hear the truth of God's Word and let God speak to their heart by His Holy Spirit through the message of the Gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation. 
And some accepted and some rejected. And that's still going on today. Because when the gospel is preached, people will either hear the gospel or they will not. People will either decide to stay in their own delusion and in their own choices, or they will say, no, 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 I'm going to be open to this. I I am open to the fact that this is true, and I want to hear it. And I'm telling you, anybody who has ears to hear can understand by the help of the Holy Spirit of God, which is His ministry, to illuminate and enlighten hearts to understand that you're a sinner, that you need a Savior, and only Jesus can forgive your sin and save your soul. So people said, some people said, Paul, I got some questions. All right? What's your question? Well, don't you know the Old Testament? I do. Well, in the Old Testament, there was that deal about Passover. Do you still observe the Passover? Well, actually I don't. Because Jesus Christ became my Passover when He died on the cross. Hmm. Okay, so you're back to that whole Jesus Christ and Him crucified thing. Yeah. You know the Old Testament, right? Yeah, yeah. Almost by heart. You know that story of that Moses lifting up that brazen serpent in the wilderness? You know, God had said to Moses, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. And then God turns around and tells Moses, Hey, I want you to fashion a snake and I want you to put it on a pole and raise it up in front of everybody. So, what, what's going on with that, Paul? What do you got on that? Paul would say, Well, uh, let me tell you why God had Moses do that. Because that was going to be a picture of what Jesus Christ would do when he died on a cross and became the object of our faith for the remission of sins and for our salvation. Oh, so it comes back to that Jesus Christ and him crucified thing. Paul said, I've just purposed when I came among you to know only one thing, and that was Jesus Christ and him crucified. And let me just help you with something if you're struggling to understand the word of God. As you're reading God's Word, would you start looking for this? Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And God's Word will start making a lot more sense to you. Because it's what it's all about. Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve in the garden. And I will put enmity between thy seed and and the seed of the woman. And and, and thou shalt bruise his heel, but he's going to bruise your head. God says to the serpent. Well, what's that talking about? Well, that's talking about the seed of a woman coming. Uh, That means not the seed of a man and a woman, but the seed of a woman. That means a virgin-born son of God that would come into the world and have his heel bruised. In other words, he would go through pain and suffering and anguish for sinners, but in the process, he would crush the domain of Satan and end his reign as the God of this world by what he accomplished in the bruising of his heel. You know what that's talking about? Jesus Christ and him crucified. And somebody says, preacher, it can't be that simple. And I'm telling you, it is. It is salvation. It is the power of God unto salvation. And here's what the blood of Jesus applied in our life compels us to do. You ready for this? Preach that message. Tell people. I'm going to promise you right now that if the blood of Jesus had not been shed for the sins of mankind, we would not about to be headed into a missions conference. But the blood of Jesus shed for sin compels us 
to make sure that the lost and dying sinners who are on their way to hell hear this message of the gospel that Jesus died for you. He shed His blood for you. His blood can be an atonement for your sin if you will trust in Him by faith. And that message has got to be preached and it's got to be preached here in Springfield, Missouri. And it's got to be preached in Greene County. And it's got to be preached in the state of Missouri. And it's got to be preached in the United States of America. Listen, we don't live in a Christian nation today. But it can be by the preaching of the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the only hope. It's the only thing. Well, people are going to have questions and I've got to have answers. You have the answer. It's Jesus and Him crucified. That's the answer. Now, we're, we're told in the Bible that people are going to have questions for us. Because the main question that people are supposed to ask the child of God is a reason for the hope that is in us. They see something in us. They see, they see some peace there. They see some joy there. They see an expectation of good things to come, which is the definition of biblical hope. And they see that in the life of Christian. And they're going to ask, what do you have that I don't have? And he said, be ready to give an answer to them that ask of you a reason for the hope that is within you. You say, well, preacher, how do I get ready? i, I got to know the answer. What's the answer? You know the answer if you know Jesus. Because the answer is this. Here's the reason for all my hope. That Jesus shed His blood for me. And God accepts that as a covering for my sin. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. You see how the blood applied compels me to tell others about the blood that it might be applied to their life? That would then compel them to tell others about the blood that it can be applied to their life. And you say, how are we ever going to reach this world for Christ? We better get to telling people about the blood. We better get to telling people about Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Well, they're going to think it's foolish. People have for a long, long time. But you never know. You never know where somebody's going to be in their life. When God by His Spirit brings you across their path. You don't know what kind of circumstances that somebody might be in. And I'm telling you, I have knocked on people's doors before and only found out weeks later that behind that door, before my, before my knuckle uh, hit it, that behind that door, somebody was saying, God, if you're real, you're going to have to show me. So I'm not sure God does stuff like that. Well, go knocking doors and find out. You, you don't know. Look, that, that cashier at the grocery store, she might be all smiles, but you don't know what's going on inside. You don't know what thoughts have coursed through her mind during, during the course of that day. And, and you don't know that, that she might not need more than just a return smile, but she might, need to, uh, she, not, she might need somebody to let her know how loved she is by God and loved so much that there was a Savior who was willing to die on a cross for her and forgive her of her sins. And I'm telling you, what I found again and again and again is often it's not the chance encounters uh, that, that God leads us to, but the relationships that God allows us to build with people out here in the public and in the general course of our lives and the people that God keeps bringing across our path and there's a consistent testimony and there's a consistent reminder. God loves you. Jesus died for you. He wants you to save Him. Won't you accept Him as the free gift He offers? 
You don't know when somebody all of a sudden who's had their heart closed, their mind closed, their ears closed, their eyes closed, and everything else. You don't know when all of a sudden one day their mind's a little bit more open. Maybe through the course of life and consequences of bad decisions, they finally come to the conclusion there's got to be more than this. And there's been times where people have thought, well, if I could just talk to that one guy again that comes in this store and invites me to church and tells me about Jesus, and in you walk through the door. I'm just saying, God loves people. God loves you. Jesus died for you. And if you've accepted the free gift of salvation, doesn't the blood of Jesus Christ applied in our lives compel us to tell others to preach the message? Well, I, I can't be a preacher. I'm not talking about up here behind this pulpit. I'm talking about going out into this lost and dying world and telling people, that they're loved by God and that Jesus is the answer. Heavenly Father, I pray that You'd bless Your Word this morning. And Lord, I pray that we would be compelled as Your children to take the message. Lord, maybe You've already put upon the heart or mind of somebody in this congregation this morning, somebody that they need to talk to, somebody that would be on their heart that needs the gospel. Lord, they need that life-changing message. And God, I pray that You'd give us the courage and the boldness to declare, to proclaim the wonderful message that somebody was good enough to proclaim to us. God, thank You for Your great love for us. Thank You for Jesus and what He accomplished on our behalf. And God, I pray that you'd bless in this invitation time. God, if there's somebody here this morning that's never trusted in Jesus Christ for their salvation, Lord, I pray that they would get that matter settled in their own heart. Lord, I ask that you would just take your word and accomplish what you will with it. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name.